Good morning, folks. My name is Kyle Spragans. I am your waterfowl section manager for the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, and will be your host for today's Waterbirds Washington virtual tour. <clears throat> Today, uh, we'll be jumping around the state, uh, being having a chance to see and talk to different uh, partners that are important in the way that we uh, manage uh, and uh, in the in the things that we do for the benefit of water birds here in Washington. Before we get started, uh, I wanted to let you know uh, this event is an opportunity to spark inspiration and appreciation of birds that we see throughout Washington, to highlight uh, partnerships that work throughout the state for the benefit of birds and their habitats, and to kick off a celebration of the approaching spectacle of spring migration. Uh, my personal favorite time of the year uh, because of the incredible annual cycle of migratory birds uh, that I think about uh, for my job, particularly the waterfowl, the ducks, the geese, and the swans of Washington. Before we get started, uh, a couple of um, housekeeping items just so that you are able to participate in all the activities. Uh, over the next 90 minutes, um, we'll be visiting three different distinct locations throughout the state. And we'll hear from five different presenters offering different insights to their region of focus and their tie to migratory birds and the habitats that they uh, think about. But all with a critical role in waterfowl and the migratory birds spring migration to hear from these partners uh, that play these important roles in the activities that go on, uh, often in the background, that play a vital role in protecting, enhancing, and enjoying habitats uh, protected for the benefit of migratory birds like waterfowl. Along the way, presenters may reference information of interest, which we will provide uh, via our Medium blog uh, that will be accessible on the WDFW web homepage uh, next, starting next week. So there's no need to write that information down. Uh, this event is being recorded and it will be available early next week on WDFW's YouTube channel. Uh, as, as we go, uh, please feel free to enter questions in the Q&A uh, area. Uh, the chat has been turned off, uh, but the, the Q&A offers an opportunity for you to submit questions uh, and, and uh, for us to get answers from either folks in the field or I'll do my best to provide them along the way. Uh, first, we'll visit uh, the shores of the Olympic Peninsula near Squim, Washington, uh, a part of the Dungeness unit of WDFW's North Olympic Wildlife Area, what locals know as Three Crabs, uh, to visit with Bob Bokelhide, a birder extraordinaire with the Olympic Peninsula Audubon Society. Next, we'll fly over to the far eastern side of the state, just outside of Spokane, uh, to visit Tina Blewett of Ducks Unlimited and Mike Rule, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's Turnbull National Wildlife Refuge, both dedicated partners to wetland protection for waterfowl and their migratory birds in eastern Washington. Finally, we'll land at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's McNary National Wildlife Refuge in Burbank, Washington, to hear from Lamont Glass with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service refuge there, and our very own Jason Fedora, WDFW's regional wildlife biologist out of the Pasco, Washington office. My task along the way is to answer some key questions that may be on your mind, like what is migration or why are wetlands important? Uh, and to provide insights, tips, some resources, and perhaps I can convince a few of you that waterfowl are maybe cooler than what you knew. Uh, also, I may be asking you to participate in, a, to an, in answering a couple questions for me along the way. So whether you are an eBird atlas or a life chaser, a lifer chaser, a seasoned waterfowler, or hopefully a newbie in the world of birds, welcome. And I sincerely hope you hear something that inspires you here today. After all, while the winter doldrums may still be clinging, daylight is getting longer, temperatures are starting to warm, maybe slowly in certain parts of the state. Water is more abundant across the landscape. And this all is the perfect recipe for plants starting to turn green, inverts and other critter food to start hatching out, and migratory birds to start becoming anxious. 
this restlessness has a term called Zugenru, the idea that birds start anticipating this approaching event of spring migration. As migratory birds are ready to depart from the marshes of Washington to find nesting areas here in Washington or far away in places like Alaska, Canada, or even Russia. But elaborate storylines unfold here in Washington that sets up that ultimate drive in waterfowl ecology. So what is migration? Migration is the seasonal movement behavior when animals seek habitat, things like food, water, shelter, or space in different regions. For many bird species, these regions are located in different continents or hemispheres of the earth. It's like an international airport system, thinking about these hubs that exist between sites and flight paths along the way. But for migratory birds, these networks, these flyways, the paths that they take to get from these different areas is more built upon blind faith. Birds move from these different areas anticipating that the habitat requirements, the food, the shelter, and the space uh, will be there. And it's along those ways that we start seeing these more elaborate uh, descriptions when you talk about different birds and their annual life cycle. That movement path along which the species can be found transitioning between these regions to seek those habitat requirements for their to complete their full annual life cycle. Washington is part of the Pacific Flyway, the, the general pattern of birds moving from these areas, the western part of the continent, Alaska, Canada, and even Russia, to areas that extend as far down to Central and Southern America, depending on what species we're talking about. Uh, capturing that general pattern of hundreds of species of migratory birds that pass through from breeding to winter and the return. And that network of sites in between in Washington, we play those roles throughout the year with different storylines depending on those species of interest. In this image, I'm displaying just a snapshot of 14 individual from seven different waterfowl species that we've marked over the years in Washington. And you can see that individuals, just these 14 individuals, touch places like the west coast of the Hudson Bay, the northern Arctic islands in Canada, Wrangell Island, Russia, over in the far west, in, uh, the far left of your screen, and everywhere in between, including cross-oceanic flights. Even your just another mallard here in Washington is worth another look. Did you know it is estimated that only 10% of the mallards that you see during the fall and winter are actually from Washington? Meaning the other 90% are coming from those faraway places that we don't always think of. And those Washington mallards have some really weird stories to tell. This photo uh, from Roy Lowe, uh, this male mallard was banded north of Afraid of Washington but spent its summers along the lush Pacific Ocean coastline, playing in the surf with friends, dining on some high quality Pacific Coast seafood cuisine. And all of this was be able to be documented because someone had, with a camera took a look, a close look, and was able to capture this insight about this band. All of this is reason to take another look or a longer look at waterfowl and the other migratory birds here in Washington. With 27 different species of duck, six different species of goose, two native swans, the waterfowl offer a diverse group of birds with unique storylines. And depending on where you are in the state, you can find a unique suite of waterfowl to take a closer look at, sharpen your identification skills, or catch a glimpse of some vagrant rarities. For example, if you wanted to find the largest bird in North America, well, the heaviest bird, it's rude to ask, but the trumpeter swan, the small spunky butterball of the waterfowl family, the bufflehead, the stunning and remarkable harlequin duck, the raucous American widgeon, and if you look hard enough out in some of those flocks, or maybe listen carefully enough, you could find its close cousin, the Eurasian widgeon, a common rarity here in Washington, and the sleek, elegant, marine seafarer of the goose family, the Black Brant. 
There is no better place than the Olympic Peninsula. And for our first stop, we'll go to visit Bob near Squim, Washington to learn more about the joys and excitement of bird watching and the diversity of species that can be found on the Olympic Peninsula. So with that, I'm gonna throw it over to Bob. Thank you very much, Kyle. <clears throat> so uh, we're very lucky here in the North Olympic Peninsula. We're standing here today at the shores at Three Crabs and it's a spectacular day. And I just wanna take a moment if I can to get you to pan around and see what the spectacular landscape looks like. So if you're Jason, you pan out towards the lighthouse. So out here is the Dungeness Lighthouse on Dungeness Spit. And Dungeness Bay is this bay of water that we see all around. Right here in front of us, we have some birds feeding. We have American widgeon and sanderlings and there's some gulls. And then looking off towards the south, we see the beautiful Olympic mountains up there. So it's really a spectacular place. Uh, we're very spoiled out here on the North Olympic Peninsula. And some of the other areas of the continent are, are frigidly cold and still ice covered. We have this beautiful day out here. Uh, and actually, you know, it might be a little too sunny. Out here in Western Washington, we really like clouds. So we don't mind clouds, we don't mind rain. And uh, it's, a, it's a just a beautiful day. We're really enjoying it. So uh, my main mission today is to talk a little bit about the partnership that my organization, Olympic Peninsula Audubon Society, has with Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, some of the birds that we've been involved with, and to talk a little bit about Dungeons Bay right here, which is uh, what we birders call our local patch. This is one of those spots where we love to go bird watching and see what birds are around. Uh, I come to this spot probably at least twice a week to see what birds are <clears throat> around, <clears throat> excuse me. And so, you know, we just love a spot like this. A little bit about bird watching. You know, I'm in the Audubon Society. There are many different birding organizations. Uh, you can belong to one of those. Most of us who were involved in bird watching became involved sometime earlier in our, in our lives. Uh, I became involved when I was much younger. I love nature. And I think that's a common denominator that we find with a lot of the people who uh, are involved in birds, involved in plants, who like to go out in spots like this. And so uh, you know, I, I just have this abiding love and interest in getting out. Birds became a focus for me because they're a great indicator, a great indicator of what's going on out there in the world. So you can come down here one day and say the tide is right. You can see birds that are feeding along the shoreline. Unfortunately, right now, the tide is not really right. It's a uh, high tide right now. The tide is starting to go out. In maybe a couple hours, we're gonna have brant that are feeding along the beach here. And brant are one of the species that I particularly want to talk about today. So Dungeon of Spit, out where the lighthouse is there, <clears throat> is part of the Dungeon's National Wildlife Refuge. And one of the main reasons that Dungeon Spit was created, or the Dungeon's National Wildlife Refuge was created, was to protect black brant. Which is the species of brant that nests, most of these brant nest in Western Alaska, up in the Yukon, Kuskokwim Delta, a few nest on the North Slope of Alaska. <clears throat> and brant are renowned as being one of the most incredible long distance migrants among the waterfowl. After nesting, they go through a molt up in Alaska where they shed all their flight feathers all at once. They go through a period of flightless, flightlessness. Then they take off from the Alaskan Peninsula and fly nonstop overland to their winter or over water to their wintering spots. Now, some of those wintering spots are here at Dungeness. Some of those wintering spots are as far south as Mexico. And so these brant are renowned for flying. Imagine flying all the way from the Alaska Peninsula to Baja, California. They're in the air for sometimes 50, 60, 70 hours, traveling at 50, 60 miles per hour, going straight down to Mexico. And when they get there, what do they eat? They have to fuel up. The same thing that they're eating there is what they're eating here. The main focus for black brand is eelgrass. Eelgrass is a flowering plant that grows out in the bay. The brant will move back and forth depending upon when the eelgrass are available. Sometimes they're feeding on the eelgrass that are in the bay. Sometimes they're feeding on eelgrass that are floating out offshore. And so one of our interesting things about the black brand is how they've changed over time in the bay. It's always very interesting to come here and see them. Now, right now, during the wintertime, we usually have about 2,000 brant around the Swim Dungeons area. Uh, during the springtime, when they migrate back north, instead of flying one flight like they do in the fall, in the springtime, they hop, skip, and jump. 
you know, one of the reasons why they come here is to feed on eelgrass, but also around that same time, we have a herring spawn hopefully happening. And the herring, well, the herring attach their sticky little eggs all over the eelgrass. A lot of the waterfowl are attracted to herring spawn. We can have thousands of scoters, it's another diving duck that's here, gathered at these uh, herring spawns. So that's a big focus here in the springtime. There's one other species that we've cooperated with Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife a lot on here in the Swim Dungeons area, and that's trumpeter swans. Uh, trumpeter swans were basically unknown here up until well, like the 70s and the 80s. It's an, it was an endangered species. They slowly recovered. We have very few here on our Christmas bird counts. They really picked up about 2008. We had a noticeable jump. Then we had another noticeable jump in 2016. So now we have oh, a couple hundred tundra, or trumpeter swans that occupy feeding areas around the Swim Dungeons Valley. Well, we have a problem. And actually the reason for the study to start originally was because we found some dead swans and discovered that they were ingesting pellets of ammunition, lead pellets, and they uh, were dying of lead poisoning. So we wanted to know where were they getting these lead pellets? So we were tracking where the dead birds were, but now the problem has become a different one. We have a problem with these birds colliding with power lines. And we have a project right now with Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife to raise money. You can go to the Olympic Peninsula Audubon Society website. And the idea is to some of these power lines that the swans regularly hit need to go underground. And so we're trying to, we have a project to cooperate and get that, uh, those power lines moved out of the way so the swans will not be colliding. With them. Another nice thing about Dungeons Bay is all the diving ducks that are here. So we have uh, things like the scoters I talked about, there's long-tailed ducks. Uh, one of the more interesting ducks that we have here is the bufflehead. And I like, to argue, or I like to brag about our bufflehead. They're kind of a bird that very few people notice. We have hundreds of them through Dungeness Bay all the way over along the shoreline to the east. And bufflehead are particularly interesting. They dive down to the bottom. They're a small duck. They dive down to the bottom. They particularly like shrimp. And so you wonder, well, if they're feeding on shrimp down in the bottom, does that mean that if we see a lot of them here, are there also lots of bufflehead or lots of shrimp that we have? on the shorelines here. Uh, we particularly are interested in bufflehead because they turn out to be the most abundant diving duck that we have in our Christmas bird count here. So bufflehead are a very important species. Uh, there's one other species I want to talk about and that's the harlequin duck. Uh, Kyle mentioned this earlier. Harlequin ducks are one of those species that uh, they hang out along the shorelines in salt water during the winter time. In the nesting season, they fly up and up the rivers, up to the Olympic Mountains. They fly as far up into the mountains, the Canadian Rockies, all the way up to the Continental Divide. They nest uh, along raging rivers, and uh, they come down here to salt water after the nesting season. So uh, harlequin duck is quite renowned around here. We're a great spot to see harlequin ducks. They're also the symbol of the Olympic Peninsula Audubon Society. So we're particularly attached to harlequin ducks. Now one little thing about birding. What's so nice about birding is we can get out and take notes and records of the birds that we see. Right now, there's a wonderful resource that's available. Everyone should become familiar with this, is what's called eBird. If you go online and just do a search for eBird, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology has developed this phenomenal resource where you can record your bird observations and then uh, go online and see what other people are seeing in other places. They've also created another resource which is called Merlin, which is used online. It's an app online that you can use for bird identification. So the combination of eBird and Merlin has pretty much revolutionized the world of bird watching. Uh, you can travel to different places. They have what are called hotspots. One of those hotspots is right here at Three Crabs. You can look up the records that have been seen by other people. You can see how your records fit in with what others are seeing. It's really a phenomenal resource. I recommend everyone take a look at eBird and how you can use it. So in closing, I just want to say uh, how wonderful it is for us to cooperate with Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife here on the projects that we have in the North Olympic Peninsula. Uh, keep looking at birds, particularly waterfowl. They all have a very interesting story to tell and uh, we're very excited to cooperate in these ventures as well. So thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you, Bob. And uh, and I got two to bounce right back at you, Bob. Uh, folks want to know what what's uh, what's with all the colorful tape on your scope. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, I could spend a whole lot of money for a scope protector. You know, you, you could spend two, three hundred dollars for a jacket that goes over your scope. But people started giving me these little bracelets, you know, these little rubber bracelets. And I started putting them in my scope and I found that they were a really good bumper. So when you lay your scope down on a rock or something, it doesn't get scratched because you've got these nice things on it. And they cover a variety of things. There's no real rhyme or reason for it. It's just, you know, protects my scope. Great. And then the other one to bounce out here, Bob, is uh, there, there was a question about uh, the Audubon River Center. When is the, the new and improved Audubon River Center set to open up? I would say we can look forward to probably the end of this year, 2021, maybe early into 2022. Uh, the building will be built, but then the problem is putting the exhibits inside which is more than half of the, the whole project. So uh, we're working on the exhibits right now, but uh, for the time being, most of the work that you actually see is putting up the building. So and hopefully by the end of this year. Excellent, Bob. Thank you very much. And uh, it looks like a lovely day out there today. It is, thank you. All right, so, um, that is that was very helpful, Bob. I am going to get the screen back open. I did see uh, I did see a question about um, telling swans from snow geese apart out in the fields, and the sort of quick answer I can provide, and I'm probably not the best one to be providing that, uh, is the uh, snow geese have black tips on their wings, and so when they fold their wings back, you can kind of see that black tip. Both swans, whether you're talking about trumpeters or tundra swan, their wing are all white out to the very tips of, their, of the flight feathers. And so that, that distinct pattern of the wing uh, coloration, that black tip in the snow geese, but the full white in the swans, that is your best bet of being able to tell you know, quickly. Uh, and then also just the, the length of the neck. Uh, snow geese have this much shorter neck in comparison, obviously longer than a duck, but uh, shorter in comparison to some of the swans. So uh, that would be that would be the best uh, best advice I could give uh, on that one. Um, okay, so let's see here. So Bob, uh, I'm glad the, the question came in about Bob's scope. Uh, the scope is certainly uh, one of those tools uh, for birders that is sort of the, the mainstay, right? The, the being able to get a better look at birds uh, is certainly something that is an important part of the, the, this uh, discussion. That map that I was showing <clears throat> is, is one example of the, of the various resources, and Bob touched on a few, eBird and uh, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. There are a lot of resources out there for folks that uh, might be uh, thinking about bird watching, just trying to improve different identification, whether you're a birder, a photographer, a waterfowler, uh, there's all sorts of reasons to try and improve those, those little hints and tips about how to tell the various uh, species apart. And so the, that map was an example of something that's provided uh, an, an effort by the Audubon, by Audubon Washington to provide something, uh, a guide along the way that's known as the Great Washington State Birding Trail. Uh, this resource is one of many, um, but it's a good starting point because one of the first things that people often ask is where to go. Uh, what, where, where do you go to see these birds, have an opportunity to observe um, the birds that you're looking at and guides uh, uh, out in nature. And so, uh, the great, the great Washington State Birding Trail breaks up Washington into six different loops, uh, these sort of general areas around the state. Uh, and it's a good starting point because with more than 500 species of birds uh, typically found here in Washington, uh, and, and each of these species looking different depending on uh, whether you're looking at young birds versus adult birds, uh, males versus females, uh, the ability to, to go out and, and 
identify some of these birds may seem challenging and overwhelming, particularly to folks just getting into it. Uh, but finding that place to practice and sharpen your skills uh, may seem even more overwhelming. And so there, there are great resources out there. This is just one example. Um, but you know, finding that place to go, the, the reality is one of the reasons I'm pointing to waterfowl is uh, waterfowl are really anywhere that there's water. Um, you could go to a local pond or uh, some, somewhere nearby to actually, uh, you know, observe them and uh, try and start teasing out that, that sort of relationship of those different uh, age or sex classes, uh, the species. And so that is an important part of that. Um, these places to go, certainly there's a whole swath of areas to go. The National Wildlife Refuges that we're, we're talking about, the wild state parks, state wildlife areas, uh, even places like water access sites. If you've ever uh, played around on the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife website, places to go. Underneath uh, the public lands, there's a list of water access sites. And these are places that are like boat launches and that sort of thing. So not necessarily what people first think of. But the point is anywhere there's water, there are probably waterfowl. And so it, it, there are some of those that are kind of hidden gems along the way that, are, that would be great to uh, explore uh, if, you're, if you're out there. Uh, one thing to know is you know, the, knowing whether or not you have the appropriate access pass. Of course, all, every one of these uh, sites has, uh, um, might have an entrance fee of some sort or require an access pass. Certainly state parks and the state wildlife areas and the water access sites would re require the discover pass. National wildlife refuges often have an entrance fee that, uh, that you either pay or the federal duck stamp, which I'll talk about here in a second, can serve as uh, your access pass to a National Wildlife Refuge. So knowing that, certainly having the proper equipment to kind of get you started, but really maybe before getting into the, the binoculars and the scopes that uh, can seem uh, cost prohibitive, having a good guide, a, a good um, identification guide. Uh, certainly there's resources like the, the, Sibley, the Sibley guide or the, the National Geographic's Western Birds, uh, you know, those are ones that folks typically have. Um, you know, there's there are other options to get you started. Certainly, the Cornell uh, Lab of Ornithology is a great resource because they have a lot of visuals and also a lot of uh, audible recordings, and so that you can start actually, you know, trying to hone your skills before you uh, get out there, and then find those places where you can start. Uh, queuing in on those details uh, that, um, that start separating, start uh, removing the blur and start, you know, crisping your ability to see certain, certain birds. Um, so having those appropriate passes, um, you know, get, gets you sort of on the go. Um, certainly things to know is about respecting the resource, understanding that things like flushing birds can be costly, particularly during the spring, like what we're talking about to birds that are are on this sort of surge uh, movement north, trying to build up resources for nesting, uh, the nesting that will happen in, in the months to come. Uh, respecting land, while I'm pointing out several uh, public land options, the reality is, is a lot of, a lot of birds are, are seen on the private lands, whether it's agricultural landscapes uh, or other private, you know, uh, uh, lands. Um, you know, res respect ownership, don't, don't, uh, don't overstep the bounds of, of uh, you know, watching from afar versus, you know, um, pushing the limit. And so, you know, but you can get creative. There are places that you would be surprised that offer these opportunities for, for, for birding uh, and for honing those skills. I go back to the dabbling ducks because in the waterfowl world, uh, the, the swans and the geese are um, what are referred to as monomorphic. Males and females look the same. And so you might be able to tease out uh, an adult bird from a juvenile bird, certainly in the, the white birds like the swans and the snow geese. Uh, you see the crisp white birds, which are the adults and the grayish, grayish kind of dull colored birds, which are the birds that hatched that previous summer. But in the ducks, uh, most of the ducks uh, are, um, are dimorphic. The males and females have different uh, plumage patterns. 
Uh, and so there's this stark contrast between males and, and females. Spring is when uh, a great time of the year to try and explore this diversity in, in the duck species because, uh, well, ducks are big. They're, you know, they're bigger. Uh, you can see them a little bit easier. Those males are more colorful, particularly during the springtime. This is when the males are coming into sort of this full blown plumage colorations. Uh, and the pairs are usually around because there's sort of this lead up into the nesting season. Uh, you're seeing males and females out on the landscape in these different uh, settings. And so there's an opportunity that is not always there at, at, at all times of the year. And the other part of that, which Bob kind of alluded to, was in the springtime, there's this shift to focusing on, on food. Uh, and, and some of the species that might be typically skittish or wary uh, not, not so inclined to come towards the shorelines of, of different things, or as people are passing, they might kind of swim away and uh, you lose that, uh, that, that closer look at them. They, because of this focus on food and this requirement of uh, obtaining that food, uh, there's, there's suddenly is sort of this calm that allows some of these birds you, uh, to be able to see some of them closer. And so all of that in the springtime is great. Um, there are things, there's sort of these different aspects of, you know, looking through these, what might seem like an overwhelming number of species um, that you can start honing in on the similarities, you know, seeing one bird and seeing, thinking to yourself, well, that kind of, that kind of looks like a teal because I've seen enough green wing teal. Uh, the size, I mentioned that the, but the uh, buffle head are really small. I mean, you're talking about a tiny little softball size type bird versus something like a tundra, uh, trumpeter swan, which can be well over 25 pounds, huge. Uh, so starting to hone this sort of like size gradient that exists across these birds is something that is possible with the waterfowl. The shape, the sort of like the profile when they're sitting on water or up on land, uh, that difference between sort of neck length that I was mentioning with swans versus the geese. Uh, sounds. So I mentioned uh, it, with the widgeon, uh, oftentimes when, when folks are looking for a Eurasian widgeon, the best thing to do is just listen because the male widgeon has this very high pitched uh, single note uh, call that stands out. If you're looking at a flock of a thousand widgeons mo moving across a field, you can often hear that call before you ever see the bird in the flock. And so uh, starting to learn some of those, uh, the difference, even telling the difference between a Canada goose versus a cackling goose, a trumpeter swan versus a tundra swan, little uh, things like the, what you hear, what you're hearing uh, uh, certainly are helpful cues on trying to hone, hone that skill. That striking coloration, you know, there are these birds that uh, when you're getting into the dabbling ducks, uh, the ones that are in these shallower water areas, the dabbling ducks uh, tend to have this much more uh, elaborate, brightly colored uh, um, plumage versus some of the sea ducks like the scoters and the golden eyes who are in this black and white contrast because they're trying to blend with the water. Uh, th th that sort of discrepancy about where they are in the landscape is something that has manifested into these coloration patterns that you see uh, particularly uh, in, in the ducks. So there are a lot of resources. Ebird, uh, Bob mentioned, the, the Cornell uh, Lab of Ornithology. Uh, from that, there is what's called the Macaulay Library, which has great photos and, and uh, sound bites of different species for you to look at. Um, all of that provides great resources. Another, uh, another uh, easy uh, guide sometimes is for us, uh, every year we we publish the, the waterfowl seasons regulations. The seasons are over, uh, and, but the reality is, is there are pages in here that have identification of the different waterfowl, particularly the ducks and uh, sort of uh, illustrative sort of side by side of males and females. If you go into any Walmart right now or Fred Meyer, there's probably a stack of these still sitting there. They're free by all means, you know, go and util utilize that. That's another resource that might be out there for you. While Bob mentioned harlequin duck out on the coast, we, uh, the, the reality is, is bird, waterfowl can wind up in different parts of the state at different times of the year. Harlequin duck provide a very good example of this and perhaps the weirdest reminder 
that that I can think of uh, as we were starting to look at uh, some research projects around harlequin duck, because while harlequin duck during the winter time uh, are are in on the coast and in these shorelines of where Bob was on the Olympic Peninsula, harlequin duck nest in the upper parts of the Cascades, the Olympics, up high mountain ranges. They're up in these tributaries. And perhaps this, the weirdest reminder was when we were capturing birds along the Snoqualmie River, not very far from the Snoqualmie Pass with the roar of I-90 in the background. So this idea that, uh, you know, there are birds at different times of the year in different areas of the state because waterfowl need wetlands. And so this relationship of, of, of these, the suite of species that we've been describing uh, and this, these habitat requirements that they're after. Uh, waterfowl need all types of wetlands at all times of the year while they're seeking those habitat requirements of food, shelter, water, and space uh, from, in terms of competition from others. The differences that exist in how some of the species go after this, the, again, the ducks have a very uh, helpful illustration because the foraging style is shaped by the water depths that they encounter. Dabbling ducks are in much shallower waters than diving ducks versus sea ducks who can actually fly essentially through the water to get down to depths that are 10, 20, 60, sometimes further down to get to benthic food resources that are at the bottom. Uh, Bob mentioned bufflehead eating on shrimp. A lot of the diving in the sea ducks are using or after crustaceans and things that are actually on the floor of uh, ponds, uh, rivers, or in, in the case of the Olympic Peninsula, the Puget Sound. So what are wetlands? So this interface of water and land, wetland types, these different forms of wetlands that are out there are, are from a combination of things like the seasonality of rainfall, the duration of water on the landscape, the frequency of flooding, the water depth, like I was showing with how ducks are utilizing these different depths, uh, and things like water salinity. All of that shapes a type of wetland because the, the thing, the sort of result, the things like plant communities, the animal communities that can inhabit, whether we're talking about in, uh, vertebrates or invertebrates that often are important food resources for these birds, particularly in the springtime as birds are seeking that food resource for the approaching nesting season ahead. When we talk about wetlands, uh, <clears throat> the reality is, is that there is this whole elaborate story in the background. Um, wetland protection, enhancement, and management is a key function in some of the waterfowl management realm. It is something that I spend a good portion of my uh, job on while I help oversee some of the, the while I help oversee the harvest regulation setting, the reality is, is that's 107 years out of the full year. And for the other 258 days of the year, we're talking with partners across the flyway, whether it's across states, across international bounds, uh, or folks like Ducks Unlimited um, to, and, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to go and do better things for wetlands out on the landscape. We uh, we benefit in the waterfowl management realm because there is this long elaborate history of how uh, the, the, the supporters, the partnerships, the, the, that, the policy that was around that and the funding resources that kind of came together uh, to help us gain momentum on making these advances. Things like the, the federal duck stamp. So since 1934, every waterfowler has been required to purchase a federal duck stamp. Uh, anybody that goes to pursue duck in any state, um, ducks or geese or swans uh, in any state, uh, must purchase this. What a lot of people don't realize is anybody can buy the federal duck stamp. Uh, you could go to the local post office and uh, or other other sort of uh, vendors uh, and and purchase a federal duck stamp. You can go online. A lot of the um, Audubon and American Bird Association they have started to provide links to be able to purchase this because. It is an incredibly important tool. That federal funding stream has been a, a, a cornerstone of a lot of national wildlife refuges in the lower 48, either an establishment, expansion, or continued uh, enhancement of the, of, the, of the resource, those wetland resources that are so vital. 
1937, uh, an excise tax on firearms and ammunition, as well as uh, archery equipment, uh, came into being, and that federal funding uh, is 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 allowed by state agencies to use license sale dollars generated to go and grab that matching fund. That is what I'm 100% supported by uh, at WDFW. These these hunter derived funds are a huge part of what state agencies depend on to do a lot of the work that we do. From 1971 to 1986, states started finally catching up and getting their own duck stamp. Uh, a lot of the states started rolling out their own state duck stamp program. Washington did not roll ours out until 1986. We were a little bit behind the curve, but the reality is, is that uh, that fund comes from uh, waterfowl hunters in the state that purchase uh, that must purchase a validation to be allowed to go waterfowl hunting. That fund is a dedicated account. It's legislatively mandated that 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 funding go back out on the landscape to do good things for wetlands here in Washington. This has been a critical component of the way that we are able to work with the partners that we're talking about, uh, and some of the examples that we'll see coming up. Um, to, to go out there and improve those wetlands at those different times of the year uh, for the benefit of certainly waterfowl, but other wetland dependent species that are out there as well. Uh, finally, in 1989, something called the North American Wetlands Conservation Act, this another federal funding source that invoked a bunch of uh, funding, again, towards the sole purpose of trying to secure wetlands that provide these vital functions for all migratory birds. Um, and that plays out in these uh, international cooperations known as joint ventures. The migratory bird joint ventures are a collection of 22 habitat joint ventures, three species joint ventures, which while started from the North American Waterfowl Management Plan, an international plan guiding sort of those collective partnerships and efforts that we put out on the landscape, it's evolved to include all of the migratory birds that have those international plants, including waterfowl, shorebirds, waterbirds, and land birds like raptors and passerines. One of these examples of sort of in our backyard, an effort that has really brought all of this together, these funding resources that we're so reliant upon, uh, are, is this uh, a project that is focused on the channeled scablings. Um, this partnership has been a unique uh, opportunity to work with a, across the groups, including Ducks Unlimited, Turnbull National Wildlife Refuge, Gonzaga University, Spokane Audubon Society, all within this joint venture uh, sort of uh, partnership. The Intermountain West Joint Venture is a collective that thinks about how do we do better for these migratory birds, particularly wetlands uh, in the eastern part of Washington and beyond there. This has evolved for us to try to understand better information about how our birds using the, the, the channel scablands. Uh, this has included aerial survey flights, the transects that you're seeing in the upper right, and marking certain individuals uh, of, of certain species, in this case, a northern pintail, to understand the movement between these wetland complexes and where these birds are headed to after leaving uh, Washington later in the spring. Channeled scab lands <laughs> might be a very weird term, and many might not realize what that term is referring to. Um, the channel scab lands are the result of, of a historic flood. 15,000 years ago, a glacial lake, an ice dam broke, and that glacial lake in Montana scoured the landscape in eastern Washington through the gorge into places like the Willamette Valley uh, on, on the water's way out to the Pacific Ocean. This scoured landscape left behind this elaborate uh, set of wetland um, depressions. Sometimes you can't even see these wetland depressions because they're so remote in parts of the state. Turnbull National Wildlife Refuge is one of these examples of trying to secure wetlands that many might not have an idea, a real good grasp of or an idea that are out there. But in this lower left figure, you can see that we are talking about thousands, if not tens of thousands, of little wetland depressions in the eastern part of the state 
that specifically during spring migration play an, uh, an incredibly important role. I'm gonna see if this video is gonna work for us. This is an example from our aerial surveys of a, of a wetland depression in what are referred to as the channeled scablands. This glacial flooding scoured the landscape, carved out these depressions, and on the sides, you see these big basalt towers, the coolies that some people refer to. One of the best examples that you can maybe visit and get a better idea of what these, uh, this landscape looks like is the Dry Falls State Park. It's a great uh, sort of interpretive center about this historic, uh, historic event that shaped the landscape that we see today, and certainly the landscape that many spring migrant migratory birds, particularly waterfowl, are dependent upon in, in Washington. The significance of spring uh, is, is hard to capture. While we, uh, while, while right now things may be locked up and cold, uh, this tension that's out there in the migratory birds, particularly the waterfowl, in this race to get food as they move back north to find these nesting spots on the ground, this critical period of being able to find these spring resources on the ground uh, is, is what drives the sort of manic nature, the frenzy that is about to unfold here in the next month uh, in this part of the state. I mentioned the state uh, duck stamp. Today, waterfowl hunters are not required to get the physical stamp. Uh, they are instead asked to buy a permit, a validation, and that fund still goes into doing the work out on the landscape. But we haven't gotten rid of the artwork. In fact, that is what graces the cover of the, uh, the annual migratory bird regulations. But anybody can go and buy the artwork um, uh, uh, through this website posting up here because our partners with Washington Waterfowl Association continue uh, the artwork and the stamp side of this function. That fund still feeds into our ability to do good things on the landscape for wetlands. Examples of this are uh, images from Robert Bateman back in 1988, third stamp, the third stamp and artwork that was created, or dramatic images that capture this sort of coolie eastern channeled scablands idea. Uh, this example of a pair of redheads uh, uh, um, by Greg Beecham. And when you look at that, uh, the uh, great Washington Birding Trail uh, description of something like Turnbull National Wildlife Refuge, you, you get the idea of the sort of seasonality to it. The description there uh, is for birding, spring equals ducks, <laughs> ready for mates and nests are redheads. And this uh, image of redheads is sort of the, the classic tie to these channel scablands because while we are focusing on spring, species like redhead have this very high association, very unique association with these special wetlands in the eastern side of the state. And so with that, um, I would like to hand it over to uh, Tina with Ducks Unlimited and Mike with Turnbull National Wildlife Refuge to share more about this interesting and unique area of Eastern Washington. Go for it, Hi, Tina. Everyone. Hi everyone and welcome to Eastern Washington. As you can see, we're still a little bit locked up here in the frozen part of midwinter. So we don't have a lot of birds to show you at the moment. So. I've been asked to speak a little bit about habitat conservation and why that's important to wetlands and waterfowl. My name is Tina Blewett and I work for Ducks Unlimited. Ducks Unlimited is the world's leader in wetlands and waterfowl conservation. We got our start back in 1937. We just had our 84th birthday in January. And throughout those years, we have worked with partners like the WDFW over the entire North American continent and other partners to conserve over 15 million acres of habitats for North American waterfowl. As you're learning about today, many species of birds migrate. They spend some time of the year in their wintering grounds, their breeding season in a different area, and then they migrate in between those two areas. They need healthy habitats throughout each part of their life cycle in order to support healthy populations and keep those populations persisting for long-term. Waterfowl are one of the best studied groups of wildlife. And so DU and our partners work with a science-based approach in order to locate projects 
and to do the types of projects that are going to best help these species persist throughout the long term. We work throughout all of North America, US, Canada, and Mexico, because that is their entire range of North American waterfowl. We do different types of projects, projects like land protection to help protect the wetlands and the other critical habitats that are still existing. We do habitat restoration. So when a habitat has become degraded or converted to another use, and we can restore it back to its original function. And we also help landowners manage their lands because these properties need to supply valuable habitat for waterfowl forever. Why do we need to do this? Aren't there enough wetlands out there? You'd be surprised. Wetlands have been lost at a high rate throughout North America. In fact, the lower 48 states have lost 117 million acres of wetlands since the late 1700s. That's 53% of wetlands that were originally there are now gone forever. So it is important to do this habitat work. And unfortunately, tens of thousands of wetland acres continue to be lost every year. Why do we work in Washington state? I am based out of Spokane, Washington and Ducks Unlimited also has staff in Western Washington. We're standing in an important, continentally important area for migrating waterfowl, as Kyle mentioned. We're here at Silver Lake in the middle of the channeled scablands, which as Kyle mentioned, is a place that's carved from Missoula, the ancient Lake Missoula in the, in the uh, last ice age and other geological events that created an area over 70,000 square miles that has tens of thousands of different wetland features, ponds, lakes, streams, and rivers that these waterfowl depend on to rest and to feed on when they're on their way north uh, to their breeding grounds. Now, these areas that fill up each spring with spring rains and snow melt host hundreds of thousands of waterfowl that will be passing through here on their way north. Now, wetlands don't just benefit waterfowl. Our work that we do with our partners also benefits many other species. Wetlands are North America's most diverse ecosystems. They host over 900 species of North American fish and wildlife. They also provide valuable places for humans for us to recreate, for cultural reasons, for hunting. And also they provide something called ecosystem services. Wetlands can help protect uh, cities from flooding. They can absorb extra flood water and store it and then release it slowly through a long, hot, dry summers like we have here. Help keep our creeks flowing. They do soil erosion. They can protect areas from eroding by storing that water and holding it instead of letting it run off. Wetlands filter water and purify it. Wetlands help to refill groundwater supplies, which are important in Eastern Washington for our drinking supply. Most of the water that we drink in Eastern Washington and Northern Idaho comes from an underground aquifer. So these ecosystem services and more are critical functions of wetlands. So wetlands are really important to protect for the future of waterfowl and our own futures. So when are we gonna see birds here? Migration usually happens between February and May, of course, depending on the weather and the season. Here, it's still pretty locked up, but when it starts to thaw, those birds that are waiting in other areas right now that are open, they're gonna be flooding through this area by the hundreds of thousands, feeding and resting and staging their way up north to their breeding grounds. Mid-March, about the third week of March is peak migration. And so that would be a great time to get out to some of these areas and Mike Rule will tell you about his refuge. Uh, and that's a great time of the year to get out here and see the migration and to learn some of these birds. So one question that I wanted to address that we get from a lot of people and I've worked for Ducks Unlimited for over 11 years and we hear from people, well, if you are all over North America, you've conserved millions of acres and you've been around for over 80 years, how come we've never heard of you? Well, one reason I think it could be is that Ducks Unlimited doesn't own a lot of land. You don't go out to the Ducks Unlimited wildlife area to go hunting or fishing. You don't go out to the Ducks Unlimited conservation area to go uh, hiking with your dog on the weekends, but you would go to the Turnbull National Wildlife Refuge or the WDFW wildlife area. Or if you live around here, one of the many Spokane co County conservation areas. Ducks Unlimited doesn't own land, but we've worked with all of these partners on projects throughout all of Washington state. 
In fact, with our partners over the last 30 years, we've done projects that are more than 70,000 acres uh, of habitats that have benefited over that time. So you may not think that it's obvious that we're here, but we've worked with these landowners, we work with private landowners, we work with anyone who has land and wetlands. And it's estimated in the channeled scablands here and in other parts of the arid west that 70 to 80% of wetlands are on private lands. Some of them are on the public lands that you can go visit, but some are on private lands. These could be private corporations, they could be private individuals, farms and ranches. So it's critically important to work with many different partners to help conserve these habitats for the future. There are many different types of habitat projects and Ducks Unlimited has a specialty in wetlands. So we provide a specialty expertise. We have biological and engineering expertise. We can come together with our partners to do site evaluations, determine what's going on with the wetlands that are there. How do they need help and what can we do to make it better for the landowner to manage those wetlands and to keep them healthy throughout the long term. We can help protect wetlands that are already there. We can help do say large engineering projects that'll move water better across the landscape over hundreds or even thousands of acres. We can do vegetation restoration projects to eliminate noxious weeds or invasive species and return vegetation to native wetland communities that are more beneficial to waterfowl. So there's all different kinds of ways that we work and we couldn't do it without our partners. Lastly, there are two really important things to mention when it comes to habitat conservation, funding and long-term stewardship. Kyle has already mentioned an incredibly, funded, incredibly important funding source and that's through hunters when it comes to licenses, uh, gear sales and taxes on those and the duck stamps. Brought a couple of visuals in case he didn't mention them, but you'll find links to these in the follow-up information from uh, WDFW. There's a federal duck stamp and a state duck stamp. And the state duck stamp and federal duck stamp go straight on the ground to projects, almost every cent of these dollars. And you can buy them too, and they go to help projects. And it's because of this funding that with our partners throughout the last 30 years, we've been able in Washington state alone, as I mentioned, to conserve over 70,000 acres and still working. Secondly, stewardship or caretaking of these lands forever is critically important. How do we know what we're doing is having an impact? Well, as I mentioned, waterfowl are one of the best studied groups of wildlife. So population studies have shown that since the dramatic decline into the 30s, waterfowl populations have rebounded and maintained throughout time. Also in 2019, a state of the birds report came out that looked at all bird groups across North America. And it found that 25% of our birds have been lost throughout North America. 3 billion birds have been lost. Now there's no one reason for all of these declines, but habitat loss was a huge factor especially in a group of birds called grassland birds. The grassland habitats have declined steeply in this country. However, the wetland bird group, those populations showed increases throughout that same time frame. Over the last 50 years was the time frame of that study. So we know it's working. So it takes a lot of partners and a lot of different methods but with all of us working together, we are making a positive difference for waterfowl and wetland habitats. Thank you so much. I'm gonna pass you on to Mike Rule from Turnbull National Wildlife Refuge. Enjoy your tour of Washington. Hello everyone. I'm, my name is Mike Rule. I'm the wildlife biologist out of Turnbull National Wildlife Refuge, which is a national wildlife refuge that's part of a nationwide system of lands. We have over 550 wildlife refuges now and 3,000 of these small waterfowl production areas and we are protect about 150 million acres. And Turnbull is actually one of the first refuges that were established using the duck stamp um, funding, which you have heard both Kyle and Tina talk about. And so we're actually the, as old as Ducks Unlimited, Turnbull National Wildlife Refuge was established in 1937, so we're 84 years old. And uh, it's really from the very beginning, Turnbull was a partnership effort. Um, we can give you a little bit of background. You know, we, as you know, we're in this channel scab land, which was created by Ice Age floods. 
creating a landscape pockmarked with literally thousands of wetlands. It was actually one of the last places in eastern Washington that was settled by um, immigrants that came over um, into this area. The surrounding the scablands is deep soil farm ground, and that was all basically homesteaded first. And so the last areas were these scablands. And believe me, the scablands is a fairly inhospitable place for somebody to try to be a farmer. In fact, the uplands around these wetlands are a lot of exposed rock, basalt outcroppings, very thin soils, really no place to farm. And so they look to the wetlands as a potential place for them to grow crops. And so back about the turn of the century in the 1910 to 1920, there was this huge effort to drain wetlands within the channel scab lands to open up farm ground. And the result was over a period of about 20 years, about 70% of the wetlands within the channel scab lands were altered some way. And particularly the really large sort of deeper wetland sloughs that the redheads in particular were really attracted to were ditched and drained. And the end result was is that waterfowl use of this area started to decline drastically. And so about 1935, a group of sportsmen in the area kind of came together, were concerned about the fact that waterfowl populations were dropping and there was also a significant drought at that time too. And so they petitioned to actually the governor of the state to potentially buy this some land around Cheney, which is where Turnbull is at, to create a wildlife area that would be state owned. But at that time, there was not a lot of money to be made, but the duck stamp was three years old at that time. There was money that was available and a big sort of a flurry of acquisition was taking place, creating wildlife refuges throughout areas that were important for migratory waterfowl. And Turnbull became on part of that list. And so Franklin Delano Roosevelt in 1937 created the boundaries of the refuge and land was started to be acquired. It took about two decades, but the refuge got to a size of about 14,000 acres. And that was all through purchases from funds that were primarily from duck stamps, okay? But so the, the first step that we did after we acquired those lands is you remember that a lot of these wetlands were drained and it took a lot of years to go back and to plug the ditches and to put in water control structures and to reestablish those um, wetlands. And as that happened, waterfowl population started to return and now Turnbull has a fairly significant population of waterfowl, about 25 species come through the area through migration and about 17 other species nest on the refuge in fairly good numbers. And redheads are one of the primary species that nest at Turnbull. It's a what we call a diving duck. It likes to build its nest over water in cattail and bulrush like you see behind me here. And then um, it's a little bit of a late season nester. So it needs water present on the landscape clear into July. And um, it's to raise its brood so they can, you know, fledge and, and return to the population. And as the pop, as we go through wet and dry cycles, populations build during the wet periods of time and then tend to drop off during the droughts. But uh, like right now, we've come through a series of dry periods. And so our population is a little bit low, but it, we've been seeing some increased wetness. And this year, you know, particularly with this late snow, I think conditions will be pretty good. So there's gonna be a lot of water on the landscape this spring when things start opening up. And it should be a really good opportunity for people to come out to the refuge and to look at, um, at waterfowl and other species. We have about 208 species of birds that use the refuge that migrate through. So not just waterfowl, but other water birds like American bitterns, Sora and Virginia rails. You know, a lot of secretive marsh birds. We have a whole host of what we call geotropical migratory songbirds. These are birds that go clear down into Mexico and Central America and come back here. Those are like warblers, orioles, and those birds like that that are mostly insect eating birds. They use our aspen communities on the refuge which are associated with our wetlands. So this is all gonna really start kind of kicking loose here probably in about a two to three week period when things start opening up. And when it opens up, it happens in a hurry and birds really start showing up here. Tina had mentioned that the large ownership of private lands uh, uh, where 
ownership of wetlands. In fact, you know, the town scablands area, about 80% is privately owned. And so a long time ago, we realized that even though we have a fairly significant piece of ground, we've actually added close to 6,000 acres using mostly duck stamp funds over the past decade, that there is this huge resource out there because those wetlands that were drained back during 1910s and 20s are actually, many of them are still drained to this day. And so there's lots of opportunity out there for restoration. And we work with a lot of partners, including Ducks Unlimited and the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, a lot of uh, conservation districts and other NGOs, um, public land trust, to kind of work together to restore as many acres of wetlands as we can. And uh, we've been pretty successful in doing that in the past decade. Um, we've added a lot of uh, acres both to the refuge and um, we've helped a lot of private landowners to restore wetlands. We have a pretty active program. The Fish and Wildlife Services Private Land Program is called Partners for Fish and Wildlife. We have biologists all over the state that provide technical and financial assistance to landowners and work with partners to do restoration activities on the refuge. So Turnbull's a really excellent place to come if you're starting to bird or if you're a good birder. We have lots of hiking trails on the refuge, bird overlooks, places that you can see birds throughout all different times of the year. And um, particularly during the spring and summer, and a little known thing, it's not really water bird related, but in May, we have a really significant bloom of wildflowers and Turnbull's a pretty spectacular place to come to to see birds and that spectacular wildflower bloom. So with that, you know, I'll give you a little bit of a feel for the area and stuff and um, I'll turn it back to Kyle. Thank you, Tina and Mike. You guys can uh, go warm up. <laughs> I'm cold looking at you. <laughs> but, uh, no, that's great information. And uh, yeah, really a, uh, a spectacular place to visit uh, when, when things are a go. And that, as Tina and Mike alluded to, it is uh, quick, remarkably quick, uh, the, the sort of change to that um, uh, that part of the year, uh, when that time period suddenly uh, rears its head and it's it's go time, the birds know it. So uh, appreciate uh, you both, Tina and Mike, uh, for that um, and for sticking it out in the cold. Uh, <clears throat> I uh, I mentioned at the beginning that I was going to ask uh, potentially ask you folks out there uh, a question, uh, and while I pose that question and you're answering it, I will. Uh, answer some of the questions that I've seen starting to come through the the uh, question and answer uh, the chat function. Uh, <clears throat> and so uh, I want to take an opportunity after, you know, talking about some of that uh, for my own sort of feedback, just to know whether that registered. Um, I, I, there, there's an opportunity if you have a smartphone or can open up another browser, if you go to minty.com, M-E-N-T-I.com, uh, it will prompt you for a code, a, a user code, and that code is 4342390. I'll leave the slide up just for a, a little bit, um, but we'll put, put that information into the chat as well. And as you folks try to start getting to that, um, here in a second, I'll bring up a, a slide that will start showing some of the responses uh, coming in. And so the, the first question, uh, there will be two, but the first one that I'm gonna pose is, so after hearing that, uh, I'm curious to know, did, did you know that artwork has that kind of role in wetland protection, conservation and management here in Washington and also uh, across the, the US and into Canada and Mexico? But uh, did you know that? Did you know that artwork played that kind of role uh, in, the, in the work that we do for, uh, for the good of wetlands. And so again, if you go to minty.com, it'll prompt you for this code. If you enter in 4342390, it'll take you uh, to um, uh, that question and it will uh, allow you to, to uh, select from four different options. Uh, and uh, if you put that option in there, um, we'll see what happens. Let's see here.
go. Let's see if I can share the screen as that information is starting to come in. That's great. Uh, folks are already, already chiming in. That's awesome. Thank you. And uh, keep going while I see if I can take a look at uh, the questions that I know have started to come in through the chat. Um, let's see here. All right, so um, I saw a couple of different questions roll in that I wanna be able to answer for you. Uh, and thank you for putting in the link. So the, the website and the uh, code are all in there. Uh, and uh, keep go ahead, keep answering as, as you have time. So I'm gonna go scroll through some of these and see real fast. Um, there was a question about that term that I use, Zugenru. So uh, Zugenru is a German word. It comes from sort of behavioral studies, animal behavior studies, but it is specifically this term used for describing this migratory restlessness that birds uh, exhibit um, uh, in anticipation of, of the need to move. Uh, they exhibit it both in fall migration when they have to leave colder areas to the north when they're uh, post hatch and post nesting uh, but they particularly exhibit this behavior uh, when, when spring is on, on the horizon. As I mentioned, day length is getting uh, longer. Temperatures are starting to rise. Uh, and because of that, this sort of line of freezing, we're seeing the freezing, uh, but that line starts to push to the north and birds are, are, are ready. So that term Zugenru is, is, a, is the term applied to that. Um, there was a question in here about the um, about lead shot. Bob had mentioned a, a, a question about uh, lead shot and what folks are doing about that. Uh, it's important to note um, this year marks the 30th anniversary of uh, of a complete ban on toxic shot in waterfowl hunting. So for the past 30 years, you, waterfowl hunters have only been able to use non toxic shot. So when we talk about the presence of lead uh, still out on the landscape, on, uh, in certain cases, there are spots where the, the shot hasn't gotten out of the, out of the reach of things like uh, swans, and Bob mentioned swans. Uh, we work with folks. Uh, one of the, the best partnerships that we have is with the Northwest Swan Conservation Association. Uh, that is a regional uh, NGO here in Washington, and uh, we work very closely with them to to look at some of those issues that still exist out on there on the landscape. But but the recognition that the lead that that might still be out there in terms of waterfowl hunting, the sh the shot shot shell, uh, is over 30 years old. It's been banned for 30 years, and so this this year is a big mark in that. Uh, and we certainly have seen improvements, uh, and one of those. Uh, uh, one of the working with partner things that we do is manage wetland uh, aspects like water depth. Uh, I mentioned that there's sort of this relationship of being able to reach the bottom uh, in situations where uh, where something uh, captures it. And, and in, with the swans, the, the situation tends to be uh, lily ponds, the root mass that exists down at the at, uh, below the surface for the lilies captures, has caught uh, some of this legacy lead shot, shot that was spent 30, 30 plus years ago. And so we work with partners to try to, to do that, but um, th that recognition that it, it has been uh, uh, banned for 30 years nationwide uh, in the waterfowl realm is, is an important one to, to uh, recognize. There was a question in here about, uh, let's see. Sorry, take a quick look. Oh, uh, there was a question about um, Brant in Everett, in the Everett area. So uh, back to Bob in the west side, Brant are marine dependent. Uh, they are very highly associated with these eelgrass beds, uh, but the sort of nuance in the storyline is they have to be able to reach that eelgrass. And because of the way tides work in the west side of the state, uh, certain areas, certain sort of far, up reaches, for example, uh, near the Nisqually National Wildlife Refuge, during the winter time, the water tide relationship with eelgrass doesn't allow Brant to get to the eelgrass. But here in the springtime, when the sort of frantic need to acquire food uh, comes on, tide, 
becomes more favorable for Brant to reach eelgrass. And so a lot more sites, a lot more smaller pockets throughout the sound and estuaries up and down the flyway, uh, the coastal part of the flyway, uh, start to become favorable for Brant to be able to utilize. Uh, and so, yeah, so that, that uh, so places like Everett, uh, certainly, it might be that wintertime is not really when you see them, but when, as you get to the springtime, uh, you start to, you start to actually see them uh, appear in the landscape. Uh, let's see here. Um, the other question I saw was, uh, what determines a sea duck? Uh, yeah, um, sea, harlequin ducks um, nesting inland, and then a question, kind of follow-up question about hooded mergansers, why are they considered a sea duck? Uh, sea ducks uh, and brant, which would be considered a sea goose, uh, th that term is applied to birds that have some part or a large part of their annual life cycle where they're dependent on marine resources, whether that's uh, the food or whether they're in areas that are, are very marine influenced, like uh, the, um, the sort of uh, the, 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 the fog line type thing, sort of the effect of sort of wet, more wet areas, uh, water kind of refreshing the system. Uh, in some cases, some of these birds are marine, marine oriented in the nesting grounds. Uh, things like Brant. Brant nests six inches above uh, the tide line in, along the Bering Sea. Uh, Bob mentioned the Yukon Kuskokwim National Wildlife Refuge, the Yukon Kuskokwim Delta. Uh, they're six inches above tide line uh, it, where, where they place their nests and they're, they're young when they're grazing are actually feeding on, on plant foods that are actually salt tolerant. They're saline tolerant and, uh, and so at different times of the year, they might have this high dependence. Some have a complete dependence like Brant on, on that marine system. The Harlequin, the question about hooded mergansers, more about uh, the, the food resource and sort of the, the body shape and biophysics. The, the legs are set back farther. They're able to dive down further. Certainly hooded mergansers wind up in freshwater resources just like bufflehead, which are also a, 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 a considered a sea duck. Uh, but you will find hooded mergansers in estuarine areas and, and little pockets along the Puget Sound, you will find little clusters of hooded, hooded merganser in, the, in that estuarine environment. Um, so yeah, so I, I see that uh, things have started slowing down. So we're at 96 folks, that's great. Thank you for providing that answer. Um, I'm gonna, there's still opportunity to answer and I'm gonna leave that one uh, up so you guys can continue to prov provide those answers. Um, uh, but I wanna shift, uh, I wanna shift to um, uh, the, next, the next site uh, on our tour. And so let's see if I can <clears throat> get this part of the presentation back up. Um, one second, sorry. Hold on, bear with me here. Uh, so we, uh, so we certainly got the um, the insight of how cold things are uh, during this sort of build up to spring, and uh, and and the uh, the stark contrast <laughs> that we see between uh, a place like the uh, Olympic Peninsula where Bob was. Uh, and a place that is uh, more like Eastern Washington and the Channel Scablands. Um, the reality is, is while I focused on waterfowl species, as you heard from Tina and Mike, uh, wetlands provide important functions to a variety of species. Uh, whether uh, we're talking about other water birds or wetland dependent species, some of those other species that Mike uh, actually alluded to, uh, th those that rely on wetlands to fill some aspect of their own habitat requirements. For example, this shot of a northern harrier seeking food or, or fuel. Nor northern harrier, sometimes the shorthand is marsh hawks. Um, because of that association with this bird to uh, marshy wetland areas uh, as a food source, right? These guys, when they're coursing over the landscape, they're seeking food. And wetlands are one of those primary sites that they go and seek that food. Mike mentioned American bitterns. Mer American bittern is one of these fascinating uh, birds that are seeking concealment or camouflage. In some cases, certain wetland-dependent birds are seeking concealment 
because they're trying to hide from predators. In the case of something like an American bittern, this uh, bird is seeking uh, camouflage so that because they're after a much needed meal that is often and almost always associated with a wetland type. You can see the cattails in the background of this American bittern. Certainly providing necessary places on the landscape for things like courtship behavior. This, this uh, sort of one of the aspects of spring is sort of this uh, behavior that's going on amongst different bird species where they're, they're setting up for that nesting event ahead, but there's a whole lot that has to play out between winter and getting back to the nesting grounds to the north. And having these shallow wetland depressions for something like a sandhill crane is incredibly important. And for something like a hooded merganser, which folks uh, mentioned, in some cases, we are talking about these elaborate displays uh, to either uh, outdo a competitor uh, with its fanciness. Uh, but the point is, is that the wetlands are what facilitate this necessary ritual that occurs during the annual life cycle. Additionally, features of wetlands provide different benefits, not only to just birds, but things like logs out on a wetland or a pond uh, can provide sunning areas for some of our uh, uh, amphibians uh, and other bird species that you might not think about that function uh, being important. Ultimately, for water birds and waterfowl, the end point is this ability to breed, the brood production uh, time period. Everything that we're talking about, this sort of setup and the build, build up of it, uh, um, uh, restlessness and the opening of those wetlands that are so critical to this, this whole annual cycle, this is what the payoff is to provide places to nest, as Mike mentioned, something like a redhead actually requires cattails to put their nest on. Um, but when broods are out on the landscape, they need something to hide it. They need to be able to survive. And so this sort of cover uh, for broods, that, that uh, tall emergent vegetation, the stuff that sticks out above the water is critical uh, out there on that landscape. Certainly these unique needs uh, of particular plants, the function that a particular plant provides like arrowhead or wapato or duck potato. Uh, those, those types of habitats are a unique wetland system requiring water on the landscape at, at, at sometimes later parts of the year than you realized. Um, and certainly one of the gr greatest examples of that are with wood ducks. Wood ducks have a unique requirement as do uh, five other of the wet waterfowl species of, they are cavity nesters. So not only are they building up these resources and needing to find food to be able to, to lay their eggs, they also need to find cavities in trees or in some cases like the golden eyes or mergansers uh, in little cave depress little depressions and cliff faces. Uh, that additional requirement sort of Having a, a cavity or a cave depression near a wetland that when the ducklings jump out of the cavity, uh, they can seek safe, safe refuge and find the food that they need to grow fast uh, so that they can gain the ability to fly are all critical functions. And one of the things with the wood ducks that I'll mention real fast is uh, working in partnership with folks like Washington Waterfowl Association, some of the local groups, certainly some of the Audubon Society chapters providing things like nest boxes is something that is a, is a core sort of piece of making sure that not only you have uh, you know, the, the water and the food side of it, but you have that other unique aspect. And tundra swans, this, uh, as we're moving down uh, towards the Tri-Cities, uh, tundra swans are, are an, an interesting part of this storyline. Tundra swans, uh, this graphic that's behind you is the marking of 50 different individual tundra swans from five different breeding areas across Alaska. This was a huge effort by USGS, the United States Geological Survey, who conducts a lot of research, particularly in Alaska, related to migratory birds, particularly waterfowl. And what we know now because of these efforts is that tundra swans in the state uh, show different connections. We have some birds up in the Skagit Valley, uh, the, around the Salish Sea, not a lot of tundra swans, but those tundra swans that typically show up there during the wintertime are highly associated with Cold Bay, Alaska, what many folks might know as Eisenbeck National Wildlife Refuge, way out on the Alaska Peninsula. However, the birds that are wintering down in the lower Columbia River 
uh, are the same birds that are making their way to where Lamont and Jason, who we're going to visit next, are located. These tundra swans that are wintering in the lower Columbia River make their way up to the Tri-Cities and then jump to places like Kalispell Lake up in northeast Washington before they make their long journey back to parts of Bristol Bay along the uh, Alaska, along the Alaska Peninsula. To see this firsthand and to have the opportunity to explore and learn about these birds and their unique habitat requirements is an important role of state wildlife areas and certainly federal national wildlife refuges that offer this interpretive aspect of this storyline. The final stop on our trip is a place that I, I can attest will blow the minds of the young birders. This is my son visiting the place that we'll be going uh, and, and, and being sort of in awe, the, the, the awe face. Uh, as spring warms in the Columbia Basin, the, the, the area of the Tri-Cities, the confluence of the Yakima, the Snake, and the Columbia provides this open water, re open water that allows birds to stage, to build, and that tension to grow. And uh, this pinch point that acts as the staging, the starting gate for this intense journey that's ahead that will certainly wind up in the areas of the channel scablands like Turnbull. Uh, this waiting for that scablands buffet of food to open to the north is, is huge. And so uh, the next and final stop will be at McNary National Wildlife Refuge, where we'll visit with Lamont, uh, with the US Fish and Wildlife Service, and Jason uh, from WDFW. Take it away. Thanks, Kyle. I'm Jason with Washington Fish and Wildlife. I'm here outside of the headquarters of McNary National Wildlife Refuge. Um, is everything working? Mm -hmm. And we're, uh, <clears throat> it's a beautiful day today. Um, like Kyle said, we're just about a mile from the confluence of the Snake and Columbia Rivers, and those waterways provide a funnel that bring uh, migratory species and water birds uh, right to McNary and make it a great place for bird watching and uh, waterfowl enthusiasts year round. Um, <clears throat> a lot of people have talked about, you know, uh, you filled in a lot about the ecology of ducks and waterfowl, and it's really a great place here to visit and see some of that firsthand. What I love about winter waterfowl is that you really see all these birds in their prime breeding plumage. That's a little different than what you think of when you think of warblers and shorebirds and all these birds that get gaudy up in their northern breeding territories. A lot of the species we see right now uh, in the area aren't going to be breeding locally, but waterfowl do their uh, mating displays and rituals in the wintering grounds. So it's, I'd really challenge anyone to watch a common golden eye throw its neck back and give out its call to its breeding display or watching rival buffalo heads bobble their heads back and forth to impress a mate. Um, and that's just adds to the beauty of winter birding uh, in our area, uh, wherever you are in the state. Um, and uh, so the, <coughs> So like I said, the ducks are pairing and breeding now on the wintering grounds and mate selection occurs in the winter and on the northward migration. Um, the one exception that's kind of interesting is the ruddy duck. Ruddy ducks are gonna be the one duck that maintains its drab plumage through the winter. And you'll have to wait till spring to see those birds in their, their uh, pure breeding plumage. But that just adds to uh, make that species a little more interesting even when it doesn't look that, um, impressive at this time of year. Um, <clears throat> one of the reasons, um, or, and in the summer, ducks, a lot of the males actually go into what's called their eclipse plumage, which is a drab, uh, more camouflage plumage, and actually can make them easily confused with females. And I always find it, it's really interesting. The reason they do this, or one of those reasons, is so that they're more camouflaged during a sensitive period of their life uh, because waterfowl will molt all their flight feathers uh, at the same time and render them basically flightless uh, for a period up to a month following the breeding season. So during this uh, sensitive period in their time that requires a lot of energy to grow feathers and makes them vulnerable to predation, they put on a cryptid plumage and really rely heavily on vegetated wetlands for cover and food during this time. Um, 
But getting back to the winner, um, there's a couple variables that are going to affect your success at going out and finding waterfowl in the winter. The first of that is going to be obvious, and that's the weather. And with colder temperature, it brings ice. And as uh, we'll show you in a little bit around me, um, we've had some pretty cold temperatures here, and the inner sloughs are completely iced over. Uh, normally, we'd have 50,000 mallards and um, thousands of uh, other ducks of various species here. And right now, we're seeing a lot of birds fly over. Those birds are all located probably about a mile away, like you mentioned, on this open water on the rivers nearby. Uh, but even with that fact, we're still seeing a lot of wildlife here this morning. You might be able to hear red-winged blackbirds and song sparrows singing behind me. There's been a Virginia rail running back and forth over the path we're on. Uh, there's a bald eagle sitting out on the ice. And we've seen flocks of snow geese and Canada geese flying overhead. Uh, and it's just been a great morning here. Um, as, the, as the lakes freeze up north and in higher elevations, uh, ducks and water birds are really going to be tied to open water. So when you can find those open water areas when the weather gets bad, you're going to have great opportunities to see birds uh, of a lot of variety of species in high densities. And so they really provide great opportunities for bird watchers if you can find that open water. And there's various points on the refuge here that give you that access to river vantage points. Uh, another aspect that um, <clears throat> comes to mind for birders in winter is hunting. Now during the fall and early winter, uh, hunters are sharing the landscape with uh, bird watchers and the, their presence can affect the distribution of birds on the landscape. Um, <clears throat> but there's advantages uh, to that for the bird watcher as well. Um, in Washington state, we have several um, areas that are waterfowl closures. Uh, these cover large tracts of the Lower Snake River, the Hanford Reach of the Columbia, and then rivers like the Walla Walla and Yakima have closed sections as well that are close to hunting. And this provides a benefit not only for waterfowl, but for hunters and birders as well. Uh, waterfowl are given an opportunity to rest and forage undisturbed. Uh, it keeps large numbers of birds in the area because they're not, um, because they have some safe areas to go to. And then during their daily movements from roost and feeding sites, they're available for hunters to uh, harvest. And so that keeps uh, the opportunity viable throughout the seasons. And then knowing where these closed areas are as a bird watcher is really valuable. So our online um, hunting regulations are valuable to that tool for both hunters, but birders can also use them to understand hunting seasons and find closed areas where they might find these concentrations of waterfowl um, at that time. Uh, and folks have already discussed before me the valuable contribution that hunting uh, and hunters pay towards conservation. Um, and so the two really go hand in hand really well. And the National Wildlife Refuge System uh, is a place that helps support uh, interest groups from several different areas, including bird watching and hunters. And McNary Wildlife Refuge is a great spot uh, that caters to both of those user groups. I'm going to turn this over to Lamont Glass, who's a ranger with the refuge system, to tell you a little bit more about the, the spot we're in. Okay, Jason, thanks for that. Good. Okay. <laughs> Welcome to McNary. Uh, so you've heard a little bit about ref what ref we do on at refuges uh, from uh, previous presenters. I want to talk a little bit about what we do here at McNary. Um, McNary was founded in 1955, and it was largely focused on waterfowl. This pond behind me here and, and passing on down the Burbank Slough uh, represented one of four ponds in about 3,000 acres. All of that focus was essentially on waterfowl and some of the ancillary you know, species associated with it. Since then, we've grown. We're now 16,000 acres scattered in five tracks along the Columbia River here as we move down the Columbia River here down into Oregon, so Washington and Oregon. In those different tracks, we have now a wider focus beyond just waterfowl, but uh, largely a lot of our active management is still focused on really providing a prime wintering area for waterfowl, providing the food resources, both in wetland areas and uh, uh, in some of our upland areas as well for uh, really critical times like now when it's out cold and you need those winter resources for the birds to keep them healthy. 
So uh, that's a that's our big push as we're doing that. Um, and uh, if you come out here, I think we've been very successful with it. Uh, right now, this is pretty pretty frozen over. But uh, um, if you've been here two weeks ago, the pond behind me had like two thousand yeah, geese on it, and you know a thousand mallards, and it was just a great place to come out and, and view waterfowl. Uh, hopefully, in, in two more weeks, it'll be open. <laughs> um, if you come and visit McNary, you know some of the things that you can do here. Uh, we, well, on refuges, we talk about, we, we have our big six. The first two are hunting and fishing. We sort of talked about hunting, uh, and, but fishermen are a big part of that too. Throughout the year, we will find uh, fishermen uh, working, working the banks, working some of the ponds, um, looking for various species, both on the Columbia and some of our off-channel areas uh, for, uh, for fish. So it's a, it's a great chance to come out, experience nature that way. For, um, uh, uh, at the refuge here, we have an active uh, wildlife uh, education program. So that's part of our what we call Big Six wildlife observation or wildlife uh, education and interpretation. Um, obviously, in a COVID situation, that's not happening as, uh, uh, so much, and um, we're shut down for now. Should you visit us post COVID, uh, then um, we have a great environmental education building that you can come in, sort of do self guided tour a lot of interactive displays and whatnot to, to learn about uh, it, uh, wildlife just on your own visit. Um, beyond that, uh, hopefully we have some sort of active program back up and uh, back and running in the near future. If you're interested in environment or wildlife uh, education, this Thursday uh, um, at 6.30, our friends group, uh, Friends of Mid-Columbia River uh, Wildlife Refuges, is hosting um, some an online uh, opportunity. It's uh, featuring Blue Mountain Wildlife, which is it does uh, wildlife rehab and education, and a photographer named Izzy Edwards, which is pretty amazing. And they're they're doing a Zoom call there. That's free. Go on, check it out. It's uh, it's a it's a really neat opportunity to see wildlife without leaving the home, as much as we want to leave the home. And of speaking of leaving the home, if you want to come out, come out. We're frozen over right now. That doesn't mean you can't see. Uh, wildlife. If you come out here, uh, we're, we're at the headquarters unit of McNary, but again, there's five different tracks and they all offer different opportunities for wildlife observation uh, and photography. If you check out our Facebook page, we have some amazing uh, local photographers who are using McNary as, uh, um, as a, you know, uh, for their, photo uh, for their uh, photography. And there's some uh, just amazing photographers, uh, photography that's coming off of there. For uh, if you want to just come out and bird watch, um, the headquarters unit has a, uh, or just come out and view wildlife. Um, uh, you, can, you can see the the, bl uh, the blind behind me. Um, this is part of our three mile out and back paved trails, ADA accessible throughout the whole reach. You, you go out and, you know, and then you can see wildlife. It takes you along the edge of, of uh, the wetland here. And it's a really nice uh, opportunity uh, to, to go out and, and see wildlife. Um, and again, uh, I give this two weeks, something like that. Uh, the, 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 the sloughs will open back up. Um, if you were here two weeks ago, again, there were thousands of ducks and geese in here. Right across the, the into the next pond, there was 15,000 snow geese that would be in there every single day. It was, it was an amazing view and hopefully it'll, you know, give it two weeks, it'll, it'll come back. Uh, we're gonna cut to uh, this bird blind over here. Uh, with Jason again, we're going to talk about where he's going to talk about some of the waterfall that you are going to see. Thank you. Hey, welcome to the bird line. Uh, this is open year round to the public. And originally, I planned to uh, share a few live images of birds uh, that were surrounding us, but because we're ice over, uh, as Lamont mentioned, there's an excellent education program here. And so we borrowed some of their uh, uh, study mounts to just show you some of the birds that I saw when I was here last week before everything froze. And so uh, there's still a bunch of northern uh, uh, shovelers using some unfrozen areas. That's our first species here. That's a pair. Uh, and then the plumage that you see now, really nice males and a big spatula bill. Um, over here, uh, ring neck ducks are one of my favorites. 
Uh, they're real sharp contrasting with the black and the big white spur that's on the side of their chest. Uh, named for a real faint uh, purplish ring around their neck that you can barely see in the field, but have a real obvious uh, number of rings on their bill. Uh, green wing teal, those are some of the smallest ducks uh, we have in our area. Um, the males now are getting into their breeding plumage and um, you usually find them along the edges of the wetlands, uh, usually near the reeds or shallower spots. Um, but they're just a really cute duck that I'm always happy to see. <clears throat> Mallards are really, um, you know, fairly your basic duck when you're starting to learn ducks. You want to compare everything to a mallard. And when you get up close, you get to see these birds uh, in person or as a mount. Mallards are fairly large and one of our largest ducks. Um, these, this is an adult male in the breeding plumage. And like I mentioned in the clips, they look a lot more like the female. Um, but notice the difference in the bill colors. The orange that's on a female's bill is going to be like that throughout the year. And that olive yellow color of the male's bill is going to be like that. So if you see a bird that looks like a female mallard that has that yellow olive bill, you're looking at a male in eclipse plumage. Uh, pintail is another common species uh, out here. This is a drake male that just looks really beautiful. I like the blue and the black on its bill. Um, and then behind me, <coughs> is a snow goose. And we've been seeing snow geese fly over us this morning outside the blind. They're going to roost on open water and feed in the agricultural fields. Um, snow goose is a species that's really one of the premier uh, waterfowl and wildlife spectacles of the winter in North America. These birds amass uh, in the hundreds of thousands. Um, and in Washington is a great place to see them. Whether you're on the west side, the Skagit Valley, or on the east side of the state, here around McNary. Um, like Lamont said, there's typically a flock of over 15,000 in the area here. Um, we've been working uh, with uh, state partners in Oregon, Washington, as well as federal partners to conduct annual uh, winter bird counts for snow geese. Um, the number in our area that overwintered has been rising dramatically over the past few years. We've got um, uh, counts uh, most recently than 60,000 birds. And those are only the ones that winter where we're taking our numbers uh, at roost in December. Um, this is before the actual peak of snow geese in our area, which occur on the northward migration with birds from California and further south. Uh, using the McNary area and other sites in Washington as a stopover. Uh, and that usually happens in March. So you haven't missed this new spectacle yet this year. It's starting now, it'll continue through March. Um, the uh, uh, other thing I did want to mention with snow geese, our snow geese are uh, in the Pacific flyway. You may have heard a lot about the ecological damage of the tundra in central uh, Canada and um, northern Alaska, snow geese are becoming overpopulated and damaging the breeding grounds. Uh, almost all the birds that we have in Washington are migrating up to Wrangell, which is in uh, Russia, and an uh, island in the Arctic. Um, it's the last breeding uh, population in Eurasia for snow geese. And these birds typically uh, come in winter uh, moved through Washington and most of them winter in the Central Valley of California. Over the past few years, we've been seeing an increase in our overwintering count because of two factors. One, the Wrangell population is starting to in, uh, increase, um, as well as more birds are starting to winter further north than in the Central Valley. So birds that used to winter down in California are now more likely to stay in the Columbia Basin or um, on the west side, uh, especially around the Skagit area. Um, so if you have the opportunity in winter to visit either of those places, you're definitely in for a treat if you can find a large flock of snow geese that get spooked up off the water. They're one of the loudest uh, uh, spectacles of uh, birds in our area and just a really impressive sight to see that many large birds together. So 
Uh, I hope you get to see them this winter, and maybe I'll see you uh, socially distanced out uh, and about at McNary or other sites uh, in the Tri Cities region. Um, and I'm just going to turn it back over to Kyle. Um, so thanks a lot, and thanks for joining us. Excellent. Thank you, Jason and Lamont. Uh, every time I see that. Uh, observation blind. I am. I'm impressed. Uh, that <clears throat> that um, that was a great overview of of that area. Uh, that sort of switch from thaw to freeze to thaw. It is. It's a game of sort of what what is out there. What's going to happen. Um, so I uh, we're right at the end. I really appreciate everybody that's been hanging in there. I have one more question for you uh at that minty.com i know that some of you have already started to chime in but that second question is open and basically uh so what waterfowl uh, have inspired you uh, over the course of this conversation or that you would want to go see um if you go and uh into this minty.com question again the code 4342390 it should already queue if you're already in there uh, you can name up the three species that come to mind. And if you use all lowercase spelling, uh, hopefully the results will be uh, uh, quite fascinating. So I'm going to put that slide up real quick here. Uh, as we're winding down and we're almost there, I, I again, I want to uh, thank all of you for participating and uh, certainly for all of the folks um, that have been uh, our presenters. Uh, and as the results come rolling in, you'll see this word cloud start moving around as people are entering the, the species names that they uh, that come to mind. And uh, it is, you know, there there is this great variety out there. Uh, certainly I'm biased. I am your waterfowl section manager. That's my job to be biased about the waterfowl. But hopefully uh, you, you've gotten something from this. Hopefully you've gotten to see sort of the uh, the the ties between the efforts that are on the ground, the wetlands that we're providing, the differences of how we have to think about those things from the Olympic Peninsula to the Channel Scablands, to the Tri-Cities and the confluences of the rivers. Um, there is a lot that goes on every year and certainly uh, the focus of a lot of those efforts, uh, the payoff is certainly felt when we get to spring, uh, spring migration. And so um, I'm gonna close with, with uh, just a couple of uh, last uh, slides here. Um, let's see. Get it back here. Bear with me. <laughs> Too many screens open. Uh, all right, here we go. All right. Uh, so yeah, I want to. Um, I just want to say a, a couple of last, you know, notes here about the fact that we're all itching to get back out there. Um, you know, certainly at this time of the year during spring migration, the festivals, the bird festivals that are highlighting this, and this is just a small snapshot of what we know goes out on out there in, in Washington. You know, some have made the call to cancel, unfortunately, but others have made the call to go virtual. And so, you know, uh, while we will get back out there at some point, the birds will be back. They will always be in these areas. Uh, and the, the efforts of the partners that we've highlighted and sort of this bigger system of migration and, and, and that realm uh, is a good, good reminder of that. And so uh, whether you're jumping for joy or dressing like a duck, uh, you know, th there's ways to celebrate sort of this. And uh, we certainly hope that you've gotten something from this. I guess one last sort of closing remark, um, while you're out there, while you're looking, I've mentioned a lot about some of our marked birds, the projects that inform us about um, the, these movement patterns. And certainly there's elaborate studies like transmitter studies, but we, we with our partners, uh, and, and various partners uh, do various duck, duck banding, goose banding, all sorts of marking studies. Uh, 
um, with duck banding, while WDFW and, and US Fish and Wildlife Service are big partners, we also rely on folks like the Yakima Nation, the Stillaguamish tribe, have been huge participators in the ability to in, in, get insights, gain insights to this, uh, this wild world of, of migration and particularly related to waterfowl. And what a lot of folks don't know is while you're out there, if you see one of these birds, like one of the collars, or you sneak up on them with a camera like this mallard on the Pacific coast, uh, you can report that. And in fact, that encounter, that report is really important to these partnerships that are, uh, that are trying to tell these storylines. For me, who tries to sh shape uh, harvest regulations and strategies uh, to fit sort of this, where does Washington sit in this bigger picture? So that's my final sort of statement there. I want to thank you all for hanging in there. Um, I, I, I want to extend an, an enormous thank you to the presenters, Bob, Tina, Mike, Lamont, and Jason for hanging out there. The folks behind the cameras making that all happen, Jason, Stacy, and Sam, and the folks that have really helped pull this all together, uh, Leah, Aaron, Rachel, uh, and most of all, Diane Tilton for being able to pull this, this off and pull these partners together for this presentation. Uh, the final closing thought is, as a reminder, we will be posting um, some of those, the, the uh, well, all of the resources that have been mentioned by our various partners along the way on our Medium blog uh, on the WDFW website starting next week. And this presentation will be posted to WDFW's uh, YouTube channel next week as well. So uh, I want to thank you all for hanging in there, and I certainly appreciate the uh, the uh, the willingness to to uh, absorb this. Uh, I hope you were inspired, and um, thank you for your time. And happy birding out there. Have a great weekend.